Hello, my name is Kishwani. It's K-E-S-H-W-A-N-I, Kishwani. <coughs> we are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been solving math problems out of this book here, the official guide to the GRE, the third edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today is our lesson number 134, day, day 3134. Three is to signify the fact that we are in the third edition. Third edition, day 134, we are in the process of working on the practice test that you will find at the very end of the book. Turn to page number 356, 356 number 12 is what we're going to do. Yesterday we did up to, we, yesterday we did up to problem number 11. Problem 12 is what we're going to do. Problem as you can see is already on the blackboard, but it does not hurt to open the book, turn to page number 356 and look at the problem yourself so that you can read it exactly the way it appears in the book. So this is the gist of it, this is the essence. It says that we have a total of 236 students. We are told that of, the two, of those 236 students, 142 are taking algebra, 121 are taking chemistry. The question simply is, what are, I changed the problem a little bit, in the book it says, in the book it says what is the greatest number of students who could have, who could have taken both courses. But we're going to do it two different ways. What are the least and the greatest? What are the least and the greatest number of students who could have taken both courses? Who could have taken both of the courses, algebra and chemistry? So we're going to look at the two extreme scenarios. So let's, so let's begin. Let's first add up these figures, see what they, are, what they are up to. We get 2 plus 1 is 3, 4 plus 2 is 6, and we get 263. But the problem clearly says that we only have 236 students. What's going on? If we subtract 236 from 263, 13 minus 6 is 7, and then this becomes 5, 5 minus 3 is 2, 27. What does this 27 represent? This 27 represents the people who are double counted, double counted. Why are they double counted? They are double counted because these are these 27 students are counted first as the number of students who are taking algebra and the same 27 students are counted again for the second time as the, as the people who are taking chemistry because they are taking both. They are double counted. Let's look at the Venn, Venn diagram. So here we have algebra, here we have algebra and here we have chemistry. We are told that 142 students are taking algebra. We are told that 121 are taking chemistry. But as we clearly saw, if we add up these two figures, we get 263. We cannot go obviously more than 236 because 236 is the total number of students we have. 27 people, we have an overflow of 27. Those 27 people are counted twice, which is why we have an overflow of 27. They counted first here and they counted here. Those are the students who are taking both. Those are the students who are taking both courses. They are supposed to come here in the common area. They are supposed to come in the common area. 27. We are going to pick up a little speed a little bit. As soon as we put a 27 there, we have to subtract 27 from here and 27 from here. Because these 27s are included in this 121. So let's subtract 27 from here. 11 minus 7 is 4. And 11 minus 2, oh, 11 minus 2 would be 9. 94. And here if we subtract 27, we get 12 minus 7 is 5, and 3 minus 2 is 1, 115. What do this number represent? What do, the, what, what do this number represent, and what does the scenario represent? 115, 115 are the number of students who are taking only algebra now. See, that was not the case before. People were taking algebra, but we were not told that they were taking only algebra. What we were told is that 142 people are taking algebra. We were not told that 142 students were taking only algebra. This is the number of students who is taking only algebra, 115. 94 is the number of students who are taking only chemistry. And 27, as we can see, are the students who are taking both. This scenario and this scenario, this outer box, outer box that we see here is called universal set, as we already know. And we have a big fat zero here. What does this zero represent? That zero tells us that this, in this scenario, in this scenario, no one, zero tells us that no one 
is taking neither. I'm going to write down the same exact thing on the top here so we can see it. This scenario represents this, this scenario is a situation where no one, no one is taking neither. Understand the language. No one is taking no one is taking neither. If you walk up, if you walk in the room where all of these students are sitting, 236 students are sitting in the room there. If you walk in the room and you say to everyone, raise your hand, those of you who are taking neither chemistry nor algebra. Raise your hand if you're taking neither chemistry nor algebra and no one would raise the hand because no one is taking neither. That's another way of saying that's another way of saying that, that in this situation everyone is taking at least one course. Everyone is taking at least one course. Either they're taking only algebra or they're taking only chemistry or perhaps they're taking both. Everybody is taking at least one course. No one is taking no one is taking neither is another way of saying everyone is taking at least one course. Other extreme scenario is this. And this by the way, this 27 by the way, is the minimum number of students, is, is the minimum minimum number of students who can take both. Who can take who can take both. So if the question was asking what is the minimum number of students in this scenario? What is the minimum number of students who can who can take both courses? Well right here, right here. That's what we just answered it. There you go. What, what, are the, what are the least and the greatest number of students who can take both courses? But the least number of students who can take both courses is 27. Is 27. Let's work on the other scenario and ask ourselves what is the greatest number of students who can take both courses? So again, one more time. Here is our algebra. Here is our chemistry. We know it's 142 here. We know 120 months are taking algebra, or 120 months are taking chemistry. But so far, the way we phrase it is say, what all we say is that 121 is taking chemistry, but the story, because the story is not finished yet. We are not claiming that 120 months are taking only chemistry. All we are saying at this stage is that 120 months are taking chemistry, as of right now. What is the greatest number of people who can take both? What is the biggest number that we can put here? Can we put 142 here? No, we cannot put 142 here, because we do not have 142 here. How can 142, how can 142 students possibly take both courses when we are told that only 121 students are taking chemistry? So even if all of those people were taking both the courses, it won't work. The largest number that we can put here, the largest number that we can put here, number of students who are taking both courses, is the smaller of these two numbers. And the smaller of the two numbers is 121. In other words, in other words, we just, we were told in the problem, we were told that 121 students were taking chemistry. What we were not told is that all of these people are also taking algebra. We were not told that. We just, we just ascertained that in this scenario. As soon as we put 121 here, we have a big fat zero here. In other words, there is no student who is taking only chemistry. In this scenario, there is no student who is taking only chemistry. All the students who are taking chemistry are also taking algebra in this scenario. Let's subtract 121 from here. And we get a 1, we get a 2, there is only 21. So in this case, only 21 students are taking only algebra. If they can ask you in this scenario, in this scenario, how many students are taking only algebra? The answer is 21. How many students are taking only chemistry? The answer is no one. How many of them are taking both? The answer is 121. And that is the largest number of students we can have taking both courses. That's the maximum. What is the greatest number of students who can take both courses? The answer is 121, which is what the book was asking. We're not finished yet. We're not finished yet. We have to finish this set. Because if you add up the figures, 121 and 121 and 21, obviously it will add up to 142. It will add up to 142 because we got this 21 from subtracting 121 from 142. So 142 is the sum here. 142 is the total sum, but we have a total of 290, 236 students. 236 students, 236 students Two hundred and thirty-six students of which of which 
104 students are taking either only algebra or both. One more time, in this scenario, of the 236 students that we have, 142 of them are taking either only algebra, which we know is 21, or both, which we know is 121. Let's subtract the two. We get a 4. 13 minus 9, 4 would be 9. 94. Where does that 94? Where does that 94 go and what does that 94 represent? That 94 will go in this corner right here. And what does it represent? That represents the number of students who are taking neither. Number of students, number of students who are taking neither. There are 94 students who are taking neither chemistry nor algebra out of these 236 students. There are 21 students who are taking only algebra and there are 121 students who are taking both courses in this scenario. In that scenario, the maximum we can have taking both courses is 121, which is what the question is asking in the book. Just look at, look at one more time. It says, it says, what is the greatest possible number of students that could have taken both algebra and chemistry? And the answer is the greatest number of students who, can, who, who, could, be, who could have taken both of these courses is 121. Do you understand? Let's, so we're done with this problem. Do you understand? We are done with this problem. Let's do a new problem. Let's do a new problem and we're going to make only one change. Let's first raise the answers. Because the answers are going to change, obviously, because the question is changing. The question is about to change. Let's change. We're just going to change one course and we're going to redo it. Instead of both, instead of both, what if the question was asked, if, the, if they were asking us what is, what are the least and the greatest number of students who could, who could have taken, who could have taken neither courses. Who could have taken neither courses. Well, we have the answer right here. In this scenario, the least number of students who could have taken neither is zero. So the least here is a big fat zero in this scenario. And the most, the greatest number of students who could have taken neither courses, neither of the courses, is 94. So it is very important that we pay attention to the wording. And in this kind of questions, one word can change the entire meaning of the problem. And you have to read it carefully as to exactly what is being asked. Do you understand? Well, enough of that talk. Let's do, let's do the next problem, number 13. Number 13. Well, we need the room. So I'm going to have to erase this thing. And number 13 is a very straightforward, very simple question. Oh, by the way, I never, oh, I don't even have it here. Oh, I do, I do have it here. So the answer was 121. The answer of this question was 121. Let's make a note here. The answer was 121. And the information that I forget to give, forget to give you is the percentile. Half the people got it right. 51% of people got it right. Let's do the next one. In number 13, we are given two parallel line, line M and line K, M and K. Let me change the marker, so this marker is getting really, really light. That marker was moribund. What was it? That marker was moribund, on the cusp of death, about to die, almost dead. And this word, we never learned it on the vocabulary, I just used it. So we have two lines, M and K, and we are told that they are parallel. We have an angle T here and we have an angle S here. Let's see what exactly they are looking for. We are told, we are told that uh, M, is, M is parallel to K, we just showed it, and S we are told, S we are told is equal to T plus 30. T plus 30. Now what we need to understand is that in a parallel line, if we have two parallel lines, if we have two parallel lines and these two angles, if you do this two parallel line, this 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 angle T is the same as this angle T. These these are the same angles. Are you with me so far? And therefore S plus T should be 180. S plus T is 180. S plus T is 180. 
but we are told that s is equal to t plus 30. Let's put it in here. So t plus 30 plus t equals 180. That in turn implies, if we, if we combine the t, so we get two t's equals 180 minus 30, which is 150. 2t is equal to 150, therefore t is equal to 75. And I believe that's what they were looking for. Yes, t is equal to 75. That's the answer is, question was what, how much is t? The answer is, t is equal to 75 degrees. And that's all it is, that's a simple question. And if you're curious, about half the people got it right, 52%. 52%. Let's do the next one, just give me one. One slight break, one small break, short break. Let's do the next one. Before I completely forget it and before I end up inadvertently erasing it, this event we learned about more about. I know we learned it. That I do know. That I do know because I use it al almost all the time when the marker dies. I say the, this marker is moribund. It is about to die. It's going to die any second. D71. If you're interested in improving your vocabulary, just type in GRE vocabulary words. Search for GRE vocabulary words. D71. And watch the video. Let's do the next one, number 14. Let's do number 14 on the top so that we don't have to do so much so low. We're done with this, you understand? Number 14. We are told that if 2x equals 3y, which in turn we are told is equal to 4z, and which in turn we are told is equal to 20. The question is how much is what is the value of 12 times x times y times z? 12 times x times y times z. Let's find out, shall we? Let's find out. So we know that 2x equals 3y, which in turn equals 4z, which in turn equals 20, which means 2x must equal 20. 3y, 3y must equal 20 as well. And 4z. 4z must equal 20 as well. Let's keep them separate. Let's put a demarcation. Let's put a demarcation. Let's put a boundary. Let's separate them. That uh, Let's put a proper boundary. Demarcate. Let's get going. Okay, I'm going to pick up speed. If 2x is equal to 20, x must equal 10. If 3y is equal to 20, y must equal 20 over 3. And if 4z is equal to 20, Z must equal 5. All we have to do is put, put them in there. All we have to do is put them in there. Let's do it here, right here. And we are being asked to find the value of 12 times x times y times z. 12 times x, which we know is 10, times y, which we know is 20 over 3, times z, which we know is 5. And that's it, we are done. It's very simple. Nothing to it. We have a 3 at the bottom, we have a 12 on the top, you see? We have a 12 on the top and we have a 3 at the bottom here. Let's cancel it. And the 12 will become 4. We're done. So we have 4 times 10. We have 4 times 10. Right here we have a 4 times 10, which is 40. And here we have 20 times 5. 20 times 5 is 100. 40 times 100 is 4,000. And that's our answer. The answer is C. The answer is C. I gave you last time the answer, but I did not give you the letter. I'm sure you can figure out the letter yourself. This one was, because it's easier, because it was easier, 60% of people had no trouble with it. But of course, that also means that 40% did have trouble with it. Do you understand? Number 15. Let's, let's take a quick look at it, what it is, the next one. Ah, number 15 is a nasty one. Number 15 and number 16, they are nasty. So nasty in fact, so nasty in fact that we're going to do them separately. I'm not going to do them together. Tomorrow we'll do number 15 and day after tomorrow we'll do number 16. Alright, bye now.